Do they all pay in 15 days? No. Um, but most of them do, to be honest with you. Hello, Skid Steer Nation. On today's show, we have Tom Gardaki, but you probably know him as the Dirt Ninja. Since he was four years old, he was sitting on his dad's lap. He's been operating heavy machinery, and he shares his knowledge and skills through his YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram channels. His precise touch and impressive skills provide entertainment and portray an attitude that is nothing short of awe-inspiring. Along with his business partner, Craig Hamill, they are owners of New Era Excavation in Londonbury, New Hampshire. Focused primarily on residential work in southern New Hampshire and northern Massachusetts. Tom, welcome to the show. Mm, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I'm excited, I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, YouTube, that's kind of where you got your big run at it. It's where I found you seven or eight years ago. Um, you were stacking beer bottles on top of each other and dropping golf balls on top of that. Yeah. I think you did it in the first take, right? I did. That is true. So, yeah, we had, we had some fun with that video. Uh, there was a little backstory on that particular video. We Every year um, we did like a little burn pile at my parents' shop of all the brush and stuff we had collected doing the landscaping throughout the year and burn it in the winter. And uh, we had had a couple friends over, had a couple beers and uh, thought we'd see what we could do with them. So <laughs> so if you actually listen in the background of the video, a couple of my buddies there are uh, kind of yelling and stuff in the background. It's kind of funny. So. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. What, what made you start posting videos to YouTube? Um, I think it was just watching other people doing it, you know, just um, thinking, Hey, I, I could do something like that. It kind of got started with uh, my parents bought me a digital camera for Christmas. Um, I think I started on YouTube in 2010. So a while ago. And, um, you know, we, I always take pictures of job sites and stuff for my parents' website for their landscaping business and kind of realized that it had a camera, you know, video camera as well. And, and that's what I started, you know, taking video with an, an actual handheld camera um and uploading it and it kind of grew from there and like you said the the beer bottle video was really the one that uh like exploded and and took off and kind of put me on the map i guess you would call it um you know again i think i only had like 10,000 subscribers at that point and um kind of took off immediately once that happened and um gotten some amazing opportunities uh, out of that, you know, I've been on TV shows and done a whole bunch of stuff, uh, going to a bunch of shows and traveled around the world and everything because of the social media. So it really honestly all comes down really to that video, how it all started. Wow. When you, when you started posting videos, did you have a vision for what it became or was it just more of like a hobby and something fun to showcase some work? I would say when I started, it was definitely for fun. Just I wanted to see what I could do, show off what we did every day. Just, you know, I've always loved running heavy equipment. So um, just show off the machines, running them around. Um, and it kind of grew once I found that, um, you know, people were following me and were interested in what I was doing. Um, I really tried to get into more like educational. Um, so it was, you know, I, I started on heavy equipment when I was four, like you said, riding around with my dad. But then I started running equipment on a job site by myself when I was 10. So, you know, I'm only uh, 35 right now, but I have 25 years of operating experience. So even back in 2010, I, I had a ton of experience for a very young person. Um, so kind of putting those videos out there and getting the interaction with the people that were watching, um, a lot of people were asking like, wow, like, looks like you know what you're doing. Can you like explain why you're doing or, or how you're doing it? Or, you know, can you explain the machines? Like what do the levers do? You know, from people who may not know what a skid steer does or in a mini excavator. Um, so it kind of grew from that. And I'd say most of my most popular videos are the trick videos and then definitely like the how-to videos, the the educational side of it. And that's what I really like is kind of sharing my knowledge um, that I have about specific things um, through the social media and, and really helping other people out. That's fantastic. Do you have anyone that helps you manage all those questions or do you answer all of those yourself? 
Yeah, I do it all myself. So I did the video shooting. I do the editing. I do the answering the questions. I do the posting. I kind of I kind of do everything I have. Um, there anybody out there that's paying attention to what I'm doing recently? I've I've been very dormant, I would say, on Facebook and YouTube recently. Um, I actually haven't posted a video on YouTube in about a year. And uh, very active on Instagram, but it's the Facebook and the YouTube I haven't been. And that's I've just been so busy um, running my own business. Uh, I have a two year old son, uh, so he consumes uh, all of my time pretty much when I'm home. Uh, So it's just uh, it's something I want to keep doing uh, for sure and get back into it. But it's just like I have to prioritize prioritize my time if I'm going to spend an hour playing with my kid when I get home or uh, editing a video so obviously i'm gonna play with my son so but yeah it's just uh it's a lot of work i think that's what people don't realize about social media you know you look at these um accounts whoever you follow that have that let's uh, say like non-celebrities that have a lot of followers right that are not just known in general beforehand like those people they spend a lot of time in it you know, it's it's a lot of work. I don't think people realize that they just see, you know, the video or the picture posted or something. And, you know, there's usually if you have a lot of followers, generally, um, you know, you're posting something worthwhile um, and it takes effort, takes thought to, that goes into that. And I think that's something that people don't maybe who don't have a lot of followers. They just kind of look at it and like, oh, you got lucky or, you know, but it's there's actually a lot of effort that goes into it if you want to be you know consistent and get gain those followers yeah so i have some experience with social media for advertising from years past and so when we started skid steer nation two years ago to me that was going to be our differentiating factor we were going to be really active in social media channels focus on education and put out a lot of content so i actually had to hire a full-time content creator and editor because i mean it is a full-time job like you said it's a lot of work yeah, and, and really answering the one of the most important things if you want to grow is actually getting back and answering people's questions. That's super important. The interaction uh, with your followers is big. You know, if you I get tons of, you know, private messages, uh, DMs uh, with just questions about how, you know, about a post I put up, some equipment that we use or a job that we did or how we did it or something like that. And like, even if it's one sentence that you get back to that person, like I can't even tell you how many people are like, Oh my God, I can't even imagine that you replied to me. And I'm like, Oh, I, I don't know. I'm just a guy. I just, I, I dig the dirt the same you do. I just happen to have a lot of people that follow me. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what I'm curious, cause your family has a really good business. You were very, you know, you, you did a lot of work in the area for them. What was your deciding factor to like separate and go out and do it on your own? Um, so I always enjoyed running equipment. That was always my thing. I very much enjoyed doing the landscaping side of it. Um, but I could just kind of tell it wasn't truly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, And the other part of it is landscaping. And my parents did specifically hardscaping. So all your paver driveways and walkways and patios and outdoor living spaces, things like that. Um, It's extremely um, difficult on your body, even with if you have all the tools and all the equipment, like you still have to lift the pavers and you got to lift the wall block. And it's a lot of uh, labor included with that. Um, And just see like my dad said knee surgeries and elbow surgeries and wrist surgeries and his back hurts and you know all that type of stuff and I didn't want to have that or try not to have that when I'm older um so I always figured hey if I can make the same amount of money um and I can just sit in a machine all day I'd much rather do that and that's what I like to do yeah did it cause any friction between you and your parents at all when you said hey I want to go start my own business or were they supportive Uh, They were super supportive. They helped us out tremendously when we started. And I actually started, well, Craig and I started the business in 2015. And I was still working full time for my parents. And Craig was actually still working full time for another excavation company. So my parents did a four day work week, uh, four tens. So we had, well, I had Friday and then we had together 
Saturday and Sunday to to get jobs done. And so obviously it's very limiting on uh, what type of projects we could tackle, but that's how we started the company. So kind of just started as like a side project almost and um, kind of grew it from there. And then Craig actually the second year um, went full time uh, and I actually still stayed on with my parents. So they were um, at that time, they were they're retired now. So they were getting closer and closer to retirement and they were extremely small. It was me, my dad and like two to three other guys. Um, and they were heavily reliant on me. I was the only one with a CDL, like they had a CDL truck. I was the only one that could drive it. Um, you know, obviously most experienced operator they had, and I was a foreman. I ran the jobs, did everything for them. Um, so I didn't want to like bail on them. Um, you know, they'd been in business for 43 years, 45 years, something like that. And no, I would never run out on them. Um, so I kind of, I kept playing the part-time game with my own business um, until they fully retired. So we actually hired our first full-time employee before I was full-time with the business. Oh, wow. So, yeah, kind of a little weird how we did it, but it worked out. Yeah, that's pretty noble of you, though. I mean, family first. I'm a big proponent of that as well. And it makes reaching the goals take a little bit longer, but you feel good about doing it the way you're doing it. Yeah, I'm very happy with how it went and, you know, helping them out so close to retirement. And they were super supportive. You know, if if they didn't need me on a Monday or whatever, a Tuesday, they're like, hey, you know, if you want to go do your own thing, if you got something you can do, then just go do it. Like, you know, it's a stupid, easy job that we're just going to bang out with a couple guys. Like, don't worry about it. So, you know, they were super supportive and, you know, it was nice. They helped us out a lot. We could rent you know their mini excavator or their skid steer from them or their dump truck you know that just saved us from having to rent from outside sources when normally we might have to rent a skid steer from you know united rentals or something for a week at a time and we could just rent from them hey we want to rent it for like half a day or a day or whatever so you know it really helped us out and i think staying on and helping them out and seeing them through to where the point where they retired i think it worked out great for both of us. That's awesome. Yeah. And renting from somebody, right. you know, is so nice. I mean, it's just a crapshoot when you get something from a big rental company and is it going to last the whole job? Is it going to break down? Right. And so you're familiar with the equipment that makes a big difference. Right. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a big, big help. And we, we bought our, um, we had our, a bigger excavator. We bought a John Deere from our, uh, one of our builders actually first. So we had that machine, but when you're trying to work, uh, two to three days a week uh, when you're starting out on the weekends, especially like just think about, and we couldn't transport it ourselves. So you, it's, it actually um, doing it like part time like that, it was extremely difficult, but I think we learned a lot about like logistics and planning and setting up your job site. You know, it's like, okay, we're planning to do this job on Saturday and Sunday, but there's no gravel pits open or we can't get our machine delivered on a weekend because our low bed company doesn't work on the weekend. So there was like a ton of planning that went into, you know, in reality, these small, you know, $5,000 job on a weekend, but it, like it taught us a lot on our, on our planning and scheduling and getting everything ready. So it was, it was a good learning experience. That's great. Yeah. Necessity creates structure and, and growth. Yep. I and mean, when you only have two days to get the job done and it's not convenient for everybody else, like you have to figure out ways to do it. Where if it's a Monday through Friday job, you're like, yeah, we'll get it when we get it. We got all day today and you just get complacent. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely that you got to figure it out because you got two days, you know, and it's, you get a breakdown on a Saturday and now you can't complete your job. And now you got to tell that customer, well, actually, we don't actually work during the week. Uh, so I get a, I'll see you next Saturday. It doesn't really go over that way. I mean, we always told people, but, um, you know, I already had something else scheduled for that next weekend. So like, it was, it was, it was tough, but we learned a lot. That's awesome. When you started the new business, did you take your social media savvy and say, this is how we're going to be able to really make an impact and get a reach in the community quick and easy? I don't think necessarily. However, it was a huge help. Um, we got a lot of work. We continue to get a lot of work 
from my social media. And um, so it's been a huge asset, but I do keep, you know, the Dirt Ninja is separate from New Era Excavation. And I do that on purpose. You know, that's the Dirt Ninja is kind of like my brand, if you will. Um, but it is heavily tied, obviously, to our work in my business. So it kind of goes in conjunction. But yeah, I like to kind of keep it separate just for own reasons. You know, I want to be able to post stuff for my kid and having fun and, you know, doing other stuff than just work as well, even though that's the majority of it. So. Nice. But the, the social media is huge. It's It all started, to be honest with you, with the landscaping business. We realized that people, especially with landscaping, they just didn't understand like what went into a job site. Okay. So just take like an easy job, like a backyard patio job. Most of the customers we met with, you know, they didn't realize, they don't know what an excavator is. They don't know what a skid steer is. They don't realize the whole yard's getting torn up to just do this 20 by 20 patio. You know, we got to bring the equipment in, we got to bring the trucks in, the dirt in, the gravel, all that stuff. So what I really did is I um, started with our time-lapse videos. So what I would do is time-lapse all of our job sites, not all of them, but like each type of job that we would do. So a patio job, a walkway job. Uh, driveway job, things like that. And I time lapse them. And so that way, um, when my father would go out and do the estimates, he could pull up our website or he could tell the people about our website and they could go there and see a time lapse video of maybe a similar job site to what they wanted. And so that way, before or while my dad was there, they get an idea of what would go into the job and kind of understand the process and um, kind of figure out how it would move along throughout the throughout the job. And uh, that was like a huge, huge value to the landscaping business on selling jobs, not necessarily like generating leads, but it was closing the sale. You know, you get to see a whole job, you know, maybe a week long job in four minutes. You know, that's pretty powerful to, to selling your work to a customer. So, if you know, if one piece of advice I could give to people is that social media is a massive free, besides your time, asset that you can use for your company, no matter what you do. You can be a plumber, you can be an electrician, you can be an excavation contractor like me, you can be a landscaper, you can just mow lawns, but it can be a huge asset if you use it properly. Yeah, it was, to expand on that, you just can't sell nonstop. Yes. You have to educate, show them what you do, and maybe have a little humor in there. But yep. it's got to be more relatable and more personable than just, hey, call me if you need a job. Right. Yeah. And the, the biggest thing I would say how it's transitioned to our work now is just potential customers get to know us before they even pick up the phone. Right. So they can go on to my social media and see pictures from job sites, us goofing around and having fun progress photos, during photos, the equipment that we use. So it's just like, it's like getting to know your contractor almost before you even pick up the phone and you're like, oh, okay, well, I already know who Tom is. You know, he knows what he's doing. I see him running the machine. It looks like he knows what he's doing. You know, he explains what he's doing, the technology they use on a job site that makes them do a better job for me. So that's really where it's big benefited us, I would say, recently with the excavation work. I bet. I, I don't remember for the life of me where I read this, but they were talking about the seven hour rule. And for two strangers to have enough trust for one to give the other one money, he needs to have like seven hours of interaction or seven hours of knowledge to feel oh. comfortable with that other person. Oh, that's cool. I hadn't heard that before. That's interesting. But with all the content you have out there, like a majority of your customers, if someone's getting ready to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars on a massive backyard redo, he's going to invest some time going through your social media channels, watching your videos, realizing you're the dirt ninja, going to that YouTube channel. And by the time you actually speak to him, he feels like he knows you. Exactly. Exactly. And I can guarantee you it works. We get probably, I want to say five to 10 jobs a year still directly from the social media. And it's just people picking up the phone and calling or message me on there and saying, Hey, I got this project and I want you to do it. And it can be big jobs too. We did a job, started a job like a year and a half ago. It's done now, but it was a road project, like $700,000 road project. Wow. And the guy called me up. Actually, no, he messaged me on Facebook. He was like, hey, Tom, he's like, been following you. 
for like eight years on social media because I know the work you guys do. I follow your stuff. I see the quality of work that you guys do. I just want you to do my job. Did you get any other bids from other contractors? Nope. And that's the thing guys don't realize if somebody calls you and because they've got that much time invested in watching you. Yep. There, there's a high probability that you're the only one giving him an estimate. Right. Right. Yep. And just, you know, I'd say be fair with them. You know, that's what we were. We, I, well, we didn't know that he was getting other bids either, but uh, at the time when we gave him a price, but you know, just be fair with people. Don't, uh, don't take advantage or anything like that. And your name will spread and help you all out in the long run. Yeah. How, how diligent are you on knowing your company's numbers? Uh, extremely. I do all the books myself. So like your operating rate and expenses and all, you know, like you're down to the dollars. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we do. We do all that. Um, I would say we're not very good yet on jo- like job tracking. I've tracked jobs, uh, but I ha- definitely haven't done it enough. Um, but I, I do feel like we have a good number or a good grasp on our numbers for, you know, bidding projects. We're actually looking at investing in a uh, bidding program uh, this winter and implementing it. And just, uh, just to help us out. Um, Cause we're bidding on a lot of large commercial, well, large for us commercial projects, like in the million to $2 million range of jobs. And they just take a tremendous amount of time to bid and just to come up with your quantities of material take a lot of time. So it's just another way we can kind of streamline our process and, and help out ourselves that way with our bidding. Yeah, it's a digital world. And there's, I mean, if you do enough research, you could probably find some sort of a software or an app, whether you're a single man operator looking for a better way to create estimates or a larger company like you trying to streamline an entire bidding process. You need to embrace this technology that you have access to today and be thankful you don't have to sit down with a notebook. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Last uh, winter, we invested in a uh, program that we can take plans like PDF plans of a site and import them in. And it will give us uh, cut fill maps, uh, quantities on materials. Now, there's a lot of work involved to get to your quantities. And that's been a tremendous help. I mean, bid on projects that, you know, you look at it on paper and you're like, oh, wow, this site, you know, balances, meaning no material has to leave the site or no fill has to come in. And then you run it through this program. And I kid you not, we finished a job this year that had 13,000 yard export. And we had thought it wasn't going to be anything just from looking at the plans. (laughs) Uh, So that I don't even know how much you can take a bath on trucking alone if you don't have that. Oh, yeah, we would have been screwed. Yeah, totally screwed. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's one technology. So this, this other program we're looking into is actually from the same company and it integrates in. So you can, once you generate all your quantities, you can import them in. And then if you have your unit pricing entered into the program, boom, it spits out a number for you. Obviously you need to enter in your time on how long things are going to take, but it's just uh, the worst part is doing a job doing it well and it comes out awesome and you get to the end and you didn't make any money because you bid it wrong. That sucks. Yeah. So I want to, you know, and that happens to us and we've been in business for eight, this will be our eighth year. You know, uh, that's just brutal because it's all that time and effort and money that went into that job. And then you get to the end. And even if you just break even, that's terrible. You know, we're not, you're in business to, to make money. Um, and not break even. So, so anything we can do on that side of it, I think is going to be beneficial to us. Yeah. Did, do you feel that doing those smaller residential jobs was a lot easier to make sure that you did profit and profit where you needed to be than it is with these larger jobs that you're now taking on? Absolutely. Um, there's just so much more risk in jobs. There's so many more things to go wrong. There's so many more things to miss um, in your bid process um, for us. So those like little homeowner jobs that take one to five days, call it like backyard expansion jobs that we do. Those are our most profitable jobs, like by far. 
uh, way more profitable. And it's because there's just less involved. There's less risk. There's not a lot of materials, um, you know, especially these days with material prices changing all the time. We've gotten caught, especially this past year, um, with price increases. Um, so we've actually implemented new clauses in our contracts um, to help ourselves cover ourselves on that stuff. So it's all the constant learn. <laughs> yeah. Constant learn. And this year seems to be extremely bad. I can't remember right. personally watching material raise anywhere from one to five dollars a ton. Yeah. Yeah. We our usual aggregate prices raise about a dollar year to year, roughly, uh, sometimes 50 cents year to year. Um, this past year, in the calendar year, it raised five dollars a ton. Yeah, I mean that's drastic compared to what we're used to. Yeah, and I, you know I'm doing some jobs that have ten thousand tons of gravel. You know, that's fifty grand. Yeah, if you don't have that built in your contract the right way, I mean, if they change that in between the bid and the work. Yeah, yeah, you can really get caught. So we got caught on a couple of jobs. So that's why we kind of, we actually adopted a clause on our contract that we were getting from one of our suppliers. I literally just copied and pasted it onto our contract. It, I don't have one in front of me, but it basically just covers you from uh, any material price increases at time of delivery will be billed to the customer. So, and we've actually changed a lot of our contracts. Um, the biggest thing that changed for us is pipe. So it's all a, a plastic product, heavily uh, affected by diesel prices. Yeah. Um, and we actually put the price, the actual price of the pipe in the quote. And so the customer knows, and I say, hey, if the price goes down, I'll refund you the difference. If the price goes up, you got to pay the difference. And I haven't had one person refuse to sign a contract because of that. It, I think everybody understands these days, it seems like when, it, when the prices were first going crazy, I don't think people kind of really realize, but now, I hate to say it, but people are kind of getting used to it. Well, um, it happens to them too. I mean, look at what's happening to eggs this year. So they can relate, they can relate to your material charges and your supply chain issues because it's happening to them on a personal level too. Right. Right. Yeah. So we implemented like that little thing. That was a big saver for us. I mean, that probably saved us, you know, tens of thousands of dollars this year, just having that, just putting the price in there. And that doesn't mean you know, we're not making money on that pipe. I still marked it up in my bid, right? But I'm just telling the customer the actual price. And it and, and that is true. Like it's the actual price. I can show them the price of the pipe at the time of the bid. I always print out my sheet that I get from my supplier. So if I ever get questioned, I can say, hey, no, nope, this is what it was just to prove it. And here's what it is now. If there's any other, any, uh, you know, questions from the customer. So I'm still making money on that, but I have that in there. And it's just being transparent, really, um, to kind of cover myself. Yeah. Do you find that the the bids that you provided to the residential customers, like you had to be more focused on the value they were receiving for the project and what the scope of the project was and the finished work? And now these larger companies, it's more line item details? Yeah, pretty much. Um, we do do our quotes a little bit differently than most other companies in our area that I've noticed. Um, and we are extremely detailed, I would say, on what you get from us, you know, the, the price and what you get. Um, and we actually break each phase. And this goes from the small residential jobs up to the big commercial. Like we break out every single phase and put a dollar value to it. So I'll just take you through a house lot, for example. So clearing the lot, okay, like taking the stumps out and hauling them off site and stripping the topsoil. That has a price and a description of what you're getting. Then it's dig the cellar hole. That has a separate line item price. Uh, backfill the cellar hole. Exactly what you're getting. You're getting three quarter stone, 10 inches of three quarter stone in the basement. Uh, you're getting six inches of gravel in the garage, just prep for your floor. You're getting SDR 35 perforated pipe uh, bedded in stone and wrapped in filter fabric for your perimeter drain. So like very detailed on exactly what you get, the materials we're going to use. Um, so that goes through everything, driveway, septic system or sewer hookup, water hookup, um, finish grade and loam, all that type of stuff. And they all have dollar values. And that's actually helped us get a ton of jobs because most of the old school, if you want to contractors, 
you know, they're just going to say house lot, uh, perform work per plan, $90,000. Yeah. You know, when ours is the same price, but the customer knows exactly what they're getting. And to me, it's way better because I don't get any questions about bills. You know, that cust- that contractor who just says, perform site work, 90 grand. But whoa, does that include the frost posts for the porch? Does it include finished grade and loam? Like, are you going to screen the loam? Or are you just spreading raw loam? Are you prepping the driveway? Are you pave- Are you including paving in the driveway or not? So we're very line item. And then if the customer asks for something else, okay, well, that wasn't in my write-up. So that's an extra. Here's how much the extra will cost. Oh, okay, no problem. And there's no arguing. There's no back and forth. So that's been huge. And even with the commercial side, I mean, I'd say the commercial side has, I think, has been a little bit more that way. So what we do for, for that is, again, we break everything out except I don't give a dollar value for each category. I give a total dollar value. And then it says in the contract, if we're awarded the contract, I'll go back through and assign a dollar value to each category. Because what I found with the the commercial projects is a lot of times um, guys will use us or anybody as like price checks, right? Like a GC as a regular guy, two guys that they always bid to, but they want to just make sure their prices aren't going out of line. So then they call us and ask us for a price when reality, they're probably never going to use us, but we don't know that. So I, we had done it the other way and provided a price for everything. And then it also caused a lot of like questions and back, oh, well, you know, this person said it was only going to be a hundred grand for the paving, but you're saying it's 250 grand. And it, it was just like a lot of back and forth. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to tell you exactly what you're going to get. I'll give you the total price. And then we'll go back through. And, and when I mean a sign of value, I mean, like on my, how I bid the job or, or my, my sheet, how I came up with my pricing, it's all broken out like that. So it's super easy for me to just go back and take my actual price and boom, enter it right in. So I'm not just saying, oh, paving is 100 grand and just making up numbers. I'm actually putting the real value in. And that's also tied to how we bill. So when I finish a task, I always call it, right? You pave. I can bill for paving. I finished digging the foundation hole. I bill for digging the foundation hole. So it helps. It like keeps us organized keeps the customer organized as well. So they know, you know, oh, look, they're starting to dig the foundation hole. I know in 30 days or 15 days, I'm going to have to come up with a check for five grand or whatever it is. So so it's just the way we like bid our jobs, I think uh, is a little unique. And that's really got to help your cash flow too, when you're able to bill in tasks or phases. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very different. Like we require... Um, except for the commercial jobs, but residential and, and builders, we require zero money up front. So a lot of companies require a deposit to even get on the schedule. I don't like doing that, to be honest with you. Like something could happen to us. We could go out of business. The, you as a homeowner might have something happen and now you can't spend the money to do the job. And you know we're booking months in advance you know, a lot can happen between there. So I don't like taking money from anybody until we actually start the job. So like for our residential jobs, if it's like five grand or less, usually that means it's like a one day job. So I'll just require payment at the end of the day. Like before we leave, you're giving me a check. Um, If it's like over five grand means it's probably a multi-day job. The day the equipment shows up that morning, I want to check for half of the work that we're doing and then half at the end, like in my hand, I don't, I don't bill residential customers. I don't bill. I get a check when I leave the job site in full or the machine don't leave. (laughs) Do you have flexibility in that? Or is that just like a a firm, firm process company policy? Um, It's pretty firm. I would say if we work, if we're working for like a repeat customer somebody that we know and they're like, Hey, like I'll give you half, but I need like a week and I'll give you the other half and I trust them. No problem. I'm always willing to work with customers. And then I moved to like the builders. So all our builders are on net 15 day terms and we bill 
as we complete tasks, as I just went through. So when we get to the job site, like to start a house lot, typically we're stumping, stripping, getting like general grading done and then, and then digging the foundation hole. Right. And then we leave for a week or two so they can pour the foundation. So those three tasks, stump and strip, um, general grading and dig the foundation hole. As soon as we're done that, boom, three line items, send them the invoice. They got 15 days to pay. Do they all pay in 15 days? No. Um, but most of them do, to be honest with you, uh, which is fantastic. We work for some really, really good builders. The, uh, the commercial side is totally different there. You're basically, uh, on their terms, which really oh, yeah. sucks. So, that's, yeah, so we're, uh, we live in Peoria, Illinois. So a lot of the businesses around us do work for cat manufacturing caterpillar and yep. it's 90 day terms and there's zero negotiation. Yeah. So we had a big problem with, a. we did a big commercial job and, uh, I knew we were kind of in trouble because they, we sent them our contract and they sent us back their contract and we had to sign their contract. I'm like, well, wait a minute here. I'm working for you. You're supposed to sign my contract with my terms. No, no, no. That's not how it works. I'm like, okay. So their payment terms were paid when paid. So I'm like, okay. Cause I'm working for a GC, right. Who's working for the owner or the, the main business. So I'm like, so what's your terms with the owner? And they're like paid when paid. What, what does that mean? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So they're like, oh, well, we usually pay within like 30 days. I waited four months, oh. four months to get paid. And I still haven't been, I, we've done three different projects with them. I've only gotten paid for one project. And we're talking, first one was $150,000 I right. waited four months for, you know, where I have $70,000 of material costs in it. So that was we uh an eye opening experience in uh cash flow going from our normal builders and homeowners and stuff up to these commercial jobs so but i would say you know like we did two other good sized commercial jobs this year and they paid within 15 days so it it just kind of depends on who you work for so you got to kind of feel it out so that was that was a learning experience that kind of sucked yeah that's what i was going to ask you was about the builders cuz i've heard just horror stories about builders that either just like disappear in the middle of the night or they, I mean, they just run away from contractors that did work for them and not pay them. Have you had any experiences like that? No, actually not with our builders. Um, I would just tell people that make sure you, as much as that customer is vetting you as the contractor, you need to vet your customer too. You know, uh, the, most builders, at least in our area, you know, I can only speak from my experience, but I can go around and ask other contractors, Hey, have you work for them? What have you heard working for them? If you haven't, you know, what's, what's kind of the deal with this guy. And if they say, you know, Hey, he doesn't pay his bills or he takes 60 days, he takes 90 days. Forget about it. I, I have no interest in working for them. So it's a two, you know, it's a, it's both goes both ways. You got to vet your customer as well. Yeah. And I think as a young company, when you get really excited that you have an opportunity to like <laughs> upgrade into a builder, those builders can smell of blood in the water and they're like, oh, we can, we can chew him up and spit him out because he, there'll be another one right behind him. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, these guys, they've been in business for a long time. They know what they're doing. You know, they're, they're working the system. They're holding on to their money and paying you at, at the last minute so they can put it into something else. So they know what they're doing. So yeah, just be cautious. We totally agree with you. When you're when you're first in business and some somebody comes to you like, hey, we really we got like 10 houses for you to do, you know, in this development, you're like, holy crap, 10 in a row. Like, wow, that's as much work as I did all last year. Like, you know, sometimes it's uh, too good to be true. So just be cautious. And yeah, your, they, eye, your eyes get big. They sound like Charlie Brown's <laughs> teacher. You didn't hear a single single word after 10 houses. And exactly. It's exactly. not going to end well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. So with New Era what's the five-year plan? Like, are you at a size now or what size are you at currently? And like, what's your goals for the next couple of years as far as growth or sustainability? Um, so right now it's uh, me and my partner and we have three employees. So we're not big. We're, we're very small. We do a ton of work though. I'd say we, we use a ton of technology and equipment and everything to kind of uh, replace the, the labor that most other companies would need. But I would say... In five years, I'd love to do 
uh, or have maybe eight to 10 guys. I want to stay small. I, I like working in the field too much. I'd never want to be in the office all day, you know, sending invoices and doing quotes. I, that drives me nuts. I hate, to be honest with you, I hate doing it. It sucks. <laughs> I'd rather yeah. just sit in the machine and, and run the job site and be outside working in the dirt every day. That's what I want to do. So I just feel that if we get too big, right, you, as the leader of the company, you pretty much have to move out of the field and you have to be in the business development side. You got to be going out and getting you know, getting leads and closing leads and quoting jobs to keep that, you know, beast fed, right? You got to go all those guys that you're responsible for that you're employing and you got to keep them busy. And you have to maintain the culture, which is harder because you're not in front of them every day. Yeah, exactly. Totally agree. Totally agree. So, you know, Craig or I are on a job site every single day with our guys. You know, we might be in two crews or three crews. We, we have some you know, we only have three guys, but they are awesome. They truly are really, really awesome guys. They can all work independently um, on different things. You know, they all have different skill levels uh, and things that they can do, but we're on the job site every day. And I think that's, that's really big to them. They see us out there. You know, I was yesterday, I was in a hole shoveling right next to the other guy, you know, yeah. and I own the company. So I think that means a lot to them. Got it. So speaking of employees, did you just stumble upon these three? Did you go through 10 to find them? Or did you have like a really good interviewing process when you were looking for them? No, they all came to me. They all, that's, I guess, the one thing I forgot to tell you about the social media. Uh, I get more inquiries about if we're hiring than I literally know what to do with. So Pat, our head guy, he was our first employee, met him on social media. and. He did a really good job uh, showing off his skills himself, right? Like how I talked about people got to know us before they hire us. Yeah. I felt like I knew Pat before he even reached or when he reached out, obviously I did my research and looked into him, checked out his Instagram page and saw the work that he did and saw he was an excellent operator. I felt like I already knew him before we interviewed him. One of our other guys, our truck driver, um, and he's also an operator. He actually worked for my parents. So I knew him before. So he came over to us once my parents retired. Our other employee, hundred percent through social media, reached out a local kid. And then we actually had two other employees, um, to start this year. Um, but one left for another job and one left to move back home and both of them through social media, just reaching out. Um, so it's been a huge asset to us. It's actually harder for me. I need to figure out like a vetting system <laughs> because I get so many people inquiring about working for us. So what I, if I was you, what I would do, like I would go to like a website, like job form or something like that. you can, I think it's free for a couple of forms like that. And I would just create like a mediumly intensive with paragraph answer style form. So everyone says, Hey, are you guys hiring? Like, yeah, here's, here's fill this out and make it just yeah. difficult enough that most people say, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And then the ones that do, you know, they're worth your time to review and maybe have a conversation with. Yeah, very true. Very true. We should implement that. But yeah, yeah. it's social media is great for that, too. You know, we tell a lot of showing up. Yeah, we tell a lot of guys, I'm like, if, if you have your values and your culture and you can actually verbalize it and show it. And if you stop saying, hey, hire me on social media and start showing who you are as a company and, and like getting your team to be a part of your culture you'll never have to put a job posting out there because guys on crews, there's a lot of crews out there where there's one really good employee and they're sick and tired of working for that bad boss. And they'll start looking for people like, Hey, I like the way you work. I want to work with you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you know, just, and show off your job sites. Like we work at a lot of cool places, like really cool places and for really cool customers. So like show it off, you know, it's great for your, potential customers it's great for potential employees show your culture like you said show you having fun you know if you get if you do extra activities for the guys or you give them bonuses or you like we do a, a week full week off in august in the middle of august for all the guys full week paid it's mandatory you have to take the week off right in the middle of summer so it's something that um craig and i really wanted to do it's you know we're in New Hampshire, right? So it's uh, spring, summer, fall, and then you get into winter. And it seems like every 
construction company around here, you're really not allowed to like take even take days off because we only have those, you know, I don't know, eight months, seven months that you can really be productive outside. And then everybody can take as much time off in the winter, but who wants to take time off in the winter? You want to take time off in the summer and enjoy the lakes and the beach and everything. So um, we implemented that this past year and the guys loved it. But that like that type of stuff, if you do anything like that, like put that on social media. Yeah, because that's a great thing to show off to to try and find people to work for you. And then I'm going to assume that the three, four weeks leading up to that week off in August you see an uptick in performance because they all know they've got to get certain jobs and certain projects completed. And exactly. you're probably and really not losing a lot of working hours. Not really. And even when we get back, right. Cause the guys are all refreshed. They're ready to go. They just had a great week off. They, whatever, they went away to Florida or they spent time with their family, whatever they want to do. So, but yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we had that conversation with the guys like, Hey, like, you know, we work for like builders and they rely on us, you know, to get the work done. So another trade can do what they need to do. Right. So if if we're not there, we don't show up on time. Like we're kind of holding up the whole process. So now we're taking a week off. Like we need to make sure that we get our work ready and set. So that week off, there aren't any issues with our regular customers. And, and we also communicated this with our customers as well, you know, so they knew well in advance and they could plan as well. So it's just communication. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Like I, I think what you're what you're doing and you're kind of creating a whole new approach to it versus what you typically see in the industry, especially with like a week time off in the middle of the summer, bringing in and exploring new technologies to advance your business for time saving and all that. And there's a lot to be learned from that. And if anyone's really struggling with their business or wanting to grow it, I, I mean, you've got a lot of educational videos on doing work, ed- technology in the work, and all of that on YouTube that it'd be a great source for people to be able to take some time and learn and try implementing new processes, theories, and equipment for themselves. Yeah. And the really, to be honest with you, the the thing that I would say really separates us and makes us be able to do the volume and dollar value of work that we do and to be as profitable as we are is really the technology that we implement. You know, we have to have the people too. That's very important as well to implement the technology. But, you know, all the GPS layout stuff we use, grade control and all the machines, tilt rotators on every single one of our excavators, you know, it's just everything that can save time, labor, uh, materials, you know, it's, it's this whole thing. It's, I always think you can grow your business by just doing more work, or you can actually grow your business by just being more efficient and more profitable. I have a theory where like, what can I eliminate? What can I delegate? And what can I automate? And what you're doing is like, Hey, what can I eliminate? Like if we can bring in this piece of equipment and it eliminates this process, this setup, this move of the equipment, we're already money ahead. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like the GPS and the tilt rotators, for example, you know, having those on site probably eliminates one to two people that need to be on the site. Just having those two technologies. Well, you know, I invested, let's call it two hundred thousand dollars, right? A hundred grand in a tilt rotator and a hundred grand in GPS equipment for an excavator. You know, most people cringe at that dollar value. It's a ton of money, but to be honest with you, it shows up every day. It doesn't complain. It doesn't call out sick, um, and it's super reliable, and it makes you more efficient. It saves your guys, if you do have to have laborers on site, it saves them a ton of work. Our, we actually don't even have a laborer, just a laborer position. Nobody on our team is a laborer, has that as their you know position because we don't need a labor. We don't need a full-time laborer, even on all these big jobs that we're doing because of this technology that we use. So it's not like, I'm not telling you to go buy a whole bunch of this stuff and fire employees. That's not what I mean. It's like, take that guy who is holding the grade rod that doesn't need to anymore because you have GPS grade technology in your excavator and teach him how to run the loader and have him hauling the spoils away, right? Make him do something that's more productive. And the guy who was running the loader can go to the other job and run the loader or the skid steer. And you just, 
you get so much more work done because you can spread your guys out more and you don't need four guys on site when you can do it with one or two people. Right. And then I would assume that with using that type of technology, short of an employee being furious with the company, they don't want to leave and go work somewhere else because it's a big step backwards in process. Oh yeah. Huge. I, I, my guys tell me all the time, they're like, I don't know if I could go work for somebody else at this point. Like now that we've used all this stuff, like, cause like for us, obviously very small company, but most of the technology, especially like the GPS stuff, like there's no other companies in our area that have as much GPS stuff as we do, or even have any really. So we're, we have more GPS stuff than some of the companies that have like 400 employees in our area. Wow. And I've got five. So it's like, you know, every machine has GPS. Every machine has grade control. Every machine has a tilt rotator. So it's like these, all our guys are like, oh man, like if I went to go work for somebody else, like, I don't know, they might pay him more. I don't know. We pay the guys pretty well. They might pay him more, but now they have, like their work is twice as hard. Is it worth it? No. I don't know. Yeah, not yeah. at all. I mean, quality of life is a big deal for people and they say they go chase that dollar, but I mean, I can't tell you how many employees I've watched leave companies I ran. It came back three, six, nine months later because they saw the grass wasn't as green on their side for that extra buck 50 an hour. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And the, um, you know, the, the technology, like I said, is all an investment. And I guess like the number one question I get is, Oh, like, do you charge more? Like, because you have all of it and you can't charge more because you have a tilt rotator. You can't charge more because you have GPS. You're making money because you're doing the job in a third of the time. So, cause that's what everybody asks. It's like, oh, okay. So you charge a hundred bucks an hour for your skid steer. Well, you put GPS on it and I charge 150 bucks an hour. Cause I just spent a hundred grand to put GPS on it. Well, no, cause it, like customers don't know that, right? They don't realize unless they're highly educated in the dirt world, a uh, customer, they're going to look at my hourly rate of $150 an hour. And they're going to look at his at a hundred and go, well, I'm going to pay him. You know, if you're bidding something by the hour, but it's really, it's cutting down on the time that you take, like bid your jobs exactly how you did them before. And now your job's going to take a third less time. Right. That's just great money into your pocket. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where they, they don't take the time to look at it and say, Hey, if I can do a job in a third of the time, not only do I make more money per hour, but I'm going to have less maintenance because the maintenance is based on hourly, you know, and that, that means less grease and less wear on the tracks. And it just, it just snowballs down. Yep. Yeah. Everything like that. And it just means you get to move on to the next job quicker. So, you know, you might be able to do, you know, a million dollars more in a year of revenue with the same amount of guys, just because you are faster. Yeah. You know, it, you know, whatever you can use, whatever numbers you want, but it, it's, that's the truth of it is you just get stuff done a lot, a lot quicker and more efficient. And like I said, it's less wear and tear on your guys. Like I can't even tell you, like, you know, in, in construction, there's still a lot of labor involved, you know, shell hand shoveling, you got to shovel around utilities, you're digging under pipes to get other pipes underneath. And, you know, there's a lot of handwork involved, but you invest in something like a tilt rotator and you can cut down your hand shoveling by like 50%. So instead of that laborer shoveling all day, right now they shoveled for like half the day. And so that next day, right. The day after they're not coming in and like, oh, my shoulder hurts and oh, I'm wicked tired. You made me shovel all day yesterday. And then, you know, my wife kept me up all night or my girlfriend. And, you know, it's like, well, no, actually you had a, it was a pretty easy day yesterday. You only had to shovel for, you know, a couple hours and the machine did most of the work. So it's like quality of life too for your employees of um, like on the job site quality of life, I guess. Yeah. And I always remember there's always, uh, I was taught this saying and, it, and it's always stuck with me, but you rise to the level of your goals, but you fall to the level of your systems. 
So if like your systems and efficiencies and processes aren't really good, you could have a goal of doing 3 million a year, but you only have the capacity to do one and a half. But if you dial in those systems and those processes and find ways to be more efficient, you're able to achieve your goals. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So I stopped being a bull in the China shop. I don't know, probably 15 years ago, I found out that it was hard on my body, hard on my mind, and it was not very successful. Yep, exactly. I just, it was kind of funny. Literally yesterday we did a job where it was like very minimal equipment. And like I said, I was literally shoveling yesterday. I was like, this sucks. I was like, why can't we just, we can't, we'll just stick to jobs where we can use our technology and stuff. Like, why do we take this job? <laughs> 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 so even me as the owner, I'm like, oh, yeah, shouldn't have done that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Oh man. Yeah. So I think it's fair to tell the, uh, the listeners out here, we met seven or eight years ago, like we talked about earlier. I was actually running a manufacturing company that made skid steer attachments. And I, I remember I came across your YouTube channel and we were looking for new and creative ways to get our product out there to get some advertising because it was just expensive to compete with like Palladin and all those large corporate companies. And I just remember watching you and I'm like, he's got a bunch of followers. I wonder if I sent him a grader. And I didn't even ask you. And I was like, I sent him an A grader and asked him for his feedback. I'm like, if he likes it, I bet he uses it and puts it in his videos. And I bet we might get some sales off that. Like, had anybody done that with you before us? People had, I work with a lot of companies. Um, you were the first to just send me one and be like, hey, try it out, uh, which was super cool. Um, and it's happened since then uh, a good amount. And I mean, I... I hope it worked out good for you guys. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I'll I, tell you, if you go to YouTube and like look up Do More Greater, yeah, your video is number one ahead of the manufacturer. <laughs> so it's, it obviously can't hurt it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's one of those things going back to social media, right? If you use it properly, it's just a massive tool. I mean, I'll give you another example. Um, Metal Plus, Snow Plows. So we bought a, a Metal Plus and used it for a couple of years, put up a ton of videos. They, so my dealer calls me one day and it's like, Hey, Tom, it's like, Hey, uh, I got uh, a customer that really wants to come out and, and see the plow and just see how it works. They're thinking about buying it, which was very normal. I get all my dealers. I have a great relationship with, and I always tell them, Hey, you want to, you got a customer, like, you know, we use a lot of like cutting edge stuff. If a customer wants to come out and see, it, I'm more than happy to show it off. Even if it's to my competitor, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. And uh, I'm like, yeah, sure. Anyways, I like delayed him like three times. It's like stuff just came up. I couldn't make it. Finally, he's like, oh, he's like, I'm coming out on Saturday with the customer at eight o'clock. Just be there. I'm like, okay, show up. He pulls in. He's got uh, a new plow sitting on the trailer, black. And I'm like, oh, that thing's pretty sweet. I'm like, where's your customer? I'm like, and who's that going to? Who bought that? And he's like, oh, it's yours. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, he's like, it's it's yours. Like, that, that's your plow. He's like, I'm taking yours. There's no customer coming. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about, Job? And he's like, and he pulls, it was all plastic wrap. He pulls the plastic wrap up. It all has my logo on it, my Dirt Ninja logo and everything. So Metal Plus just sent me a brand. It's like a $40,000 plow. Just wow. sent me a brand new plow. All yeah. custom done and got a call from their marketing manager. It was like, You've helped us sell so many plows. We appreciate it. This is just like a token of thank you from us. You know, so I'd say that's like the most extreme, but, you know, like being educational and showing off your skills and sharing your knowledge and your experiences, like it's great for followers. It's great for relationships with manufacturers. It's great with relationships with your dealer. Like I have a fantastic relationship with my dealer because of social media, you know, like we buy a lot of Caterpillar stuff. Uh, great relationship with my dealer. Like I said, like bring customers out. I don't care. You know, if I need to rent something uh, like my dealer only rents for one month at a time, my cat dealer, that's the minimum time. They'll rent me, let me rent for a day if I want. That's awesome. Because of our relationship. Yeah. You know? so it's, and it's all built from that social media. So it's just using the most social media in the proper format, being professional, representing yourself properly, represent your business, represent, the stuff that you use every day. Don't just, if you have a problem, call the manufacturer, call your dealer. Don't just trash it online. 
you know, if they don't respond and you want to go to that level, then that's your decision. But I would caution you against that. You never know yeah. what can happen. Yeah. And I just want to throw in there for guys, because I'm sure you're hearing a lot of people out there right now. I was like, well, yeah, that's great. When you have 70, hundred thousand followers, <laughs> you know, we've got 300 people that like our Facebook page. It doesn't matter if you make the video and you show gratitude towards a vendor or you show gratitude towards the dealer, or you talk with the customer and you share that video with like your sales rep, the time that you took to make it. And the fact that you thought about making it to share it, even if it is a smaller audience, they don't forget it. Yep. And remember, it only takes one video for you to get noticed. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be stacking beer bottles. You can make a cool video video of using an attachment and being showing your skills and how you use it. And if it resonates with people and they share it, you get a hundred thousand views on just how you use a power rake. You know, if it's super educational and people learn a lot from it, if you get a hundred thousand views, I guarantee you that manufacturer is going to see it and somebody's going to reach out to you and at least send you some swag. <laughs> yeah. If and not, do and better. it's got to make your day go by easier too. Cause you like, you're concentrating a little bit on the video and the talking and you're not just staring at the dirt out in front of you. It's got to make the time pass a little better. Yeah, exactly. It's just a lot of fun. Yeah. And then with TikTok now, I've seen a lot of guys that are just like going live and they got a camera mount in their excavator and it's just on all day, the whole time they work. And I don't know how many people are watching them, but a question will pop up and they're like, Oh yeah. And they answer the question and, I'm like, that's got to make the day more enjoyable than just sitting there swinging back and forth. Yeah, exactly. Totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. Have some fun with it. Yeah, man. Well, Tom, thanks so much, man. It's this was a this was a great conversation. It's always wonderful to talk to some professionals in the industry. That's most of the people we work with and deal with on our end are more at the five years and younger or five to ten, but they're really happy where they're at. So to hear perspective of a company that's like grown quickly from residential to commercial to now larger scale pro properties, I really appreciate it. I learned a lot from you today. I hope the listeners learn from you as well. And I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great. Yeah. Well, guys, that's a wrap for today's show. If you enjoyed it, I have one simple request. All you have to do is please hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to podcasts and share this with your social media network. Let people know about the podcast. We don't charge you guys any money. We don't even have advertisers, if you don't count myself. So we do this all for you so you can learn and have a resource to make your business better. So please subscribe and like, and we'll see you on the next episode.